One, two, three. Mic check. Christ is risen. 
Hallelujah. Welcome to worship this Easter morning at First Baptist. I'm Carol McIntyre, the pastor here, and we are delighted to have you join us for worship this morning. As we turn our hearts and our minds to the worship of God this morning, we begin with a monologue, Mary Magdalene on Easter morning, performed by a theater student from Stevens College. We saw where they laid him, how they wrapped him in linen. We saw their shoulders pushing that stone into place, the sound of it grinding shut. And though our eyes streamed with tears, we marked the place, for we knew we would come back. And on the first day of the week, we came, arms full of aromatic oils and spices, cinnamon, cassia, myrrh resources pooled in a fragrant offering, one last service for Jesus. We walked the dark path, the sky just beginning to lighten. What we saw in the semi-darkness was not the closed tomb we had expected, but a gaping hole. Alarmed, we looked inside, seeing that Jesus' body was gone. Someone had been there before us. How could this be? Uh, grave robbers? Uh, some final act of blasphemy against our Savior? Had Pilate changed his mind and was Jesus' corpse now hanging somewhere for all to see? I dropped all I was carrying and I ran to find the disciples. Peter and John came racing back, entering the tomb. Jesus was not there. I stood with them, our hands on the giant stone, confusion written on our faces. They left, but I remained, gathering up all those spices, my tears dropping on the ground. Would this suffering never end? I turned and looked again in the tomb, but this time there was not darkness, but light. Two angels sitting where Jesus' body should be, and they asked me why I was weeping. Why was I weeping? And then another man, a gardener, suddenly there behind me, asking about my tears. All I wanted was Jesus' body, so that I could do what I came here for. Mourn properly, anoint him with these spices in my arms. Where is Jesus? Tell me if you know I cried. And then he said my name. And I suddenly recognized him. Jesus, not dead, not cold, not lifeless, not gone forever. Jesus, alive before me, talking, looking in my eyes. My heart about burst as I reached out to hold him, to see if he was real, touchable. Jesus in the flesh. He talked of my God and of your God, and suddenly it was real to me. It was not God far away, not God not listening, but God present. God making morning miracles out of death's darkness. Jesus told me to go and tell the others. I threw the spices on the ground, no need of them now, and I started running, faster than my feet have ever moved. Beautiful was the good news. My lament has turned to joy. I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. celebrate the good news of God's love. We are called to be Easter people. Darkness cannot claim us. Fear cannot bind us. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia.
Christ is risen. Alleluia, Christ is with us. Where shattered hearts are made whole, where wounded souls are healed, where life is stronger than death, there the stone has been rolled away. Where the lonely become our friends, where a stranger is welcomed home, where hope is stronger than despair, there we find Jesus walking. Where closed minds are opened, where the anxious find serenity, where love is stronger than hate, there Jesus is opening our eyes. The stone has been rolled away. Jesus is our companion on the journey. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Alleluia, Christ is with us. Turn around. Hey, guys. How's it going? Say Happy Easter. Happy. Say it out to them. Happy Easter. What do you say? Happy Easter. Whoa, that's amazing. All right. A few of us, some of us, are going to sing a song here in a minute called In the Bulb. And we've been talking about In the Bulb because why? Anybody know? Because it's kind of weird to go, In the Bulb, there's a flower. Oh. 
The real reason for the song was because of Jesus, and today being Easter, Jesus risen. And what did, what did they find in that tomb? What did they find? Did you hear that? Oh my gosh, yeah, a shoe that's broken. I don't... Uh, you blew some rubber there, buddy. No, when they looked in the tomb, they found nothing. It was empty. And sometimes in singing, there's a song that goes, In the bulb, there's a flower. In the sea, there's an apple tree. In cocoons, it didn't promise. What's in the cocoon? About butterfly, maybe? All right, so we're going to do a show and tell. If you can look back this way, I have this lovely pot. Some of you have seen it, and it's broken. And it's broken for a reason. I'm going to do something. So what did I just pull out? A root. Yep. Okay, that did the whole illustration right there. That would be a, a bulb, a bulb. There are two bulbs there. One is a tulip bulb, this one. And one is a hyacinth. Say hyacinth. All right. So when you, when you plant a bulb, what happens? A flower grows. And we think this is like this all of spring, all of this around you, it bulbs with flowers. So it kind of is like in the bulb there is a flower in the seed and apple tree. So we're going to sing that for some of our friends here today. So if you guys who are singing, stand up with me. I'll stand up, ready? We're going to sing it once, and then we want you guys to join us. The words are in the bulletin. It goes like this. In the bulb, there is a flower. In the seed, an apple tree. In cocoons, a hidden promise. Butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter, there's a spring. To be unrevealed until it's season, something God alone can see. Whoa, you guys are amazing, but now they're going to join us, and it'll be even more amazing or, <laughs> or something like that. Ready? In the poem, there is a flower in the sea. Now, after church, if you guys want, I have some bulbs you can take home and plant. So come find me after church. Say Happy Easter again. And you'll follow Miss Chelsea or you're going back to your moms and dads. So thank you. And I think that's our cue to stand up because... Uh, it's time to pass the peace of Christ. So pass the peace of Christ to those around you. Peace be with you.
As you're making your way back to your seats, Mark Thomas is coming this morning to read our gospel reading. chapter 20, uh, verses uh, 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. <coughs> Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced this to the disciples. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Will you pray with me? the bright and morning star. God of the rising sun, we praise you and we worship you. For empty tombs, thank you. For disciples running with good news, thank you. For your presence, alive, powerful, and resurrected, thank you. We celebrate your victory over death and over all that would defeat us. Help us, O oh God, to grasp 
your resurrection. To understand its power, to see its force at work in our world, overturning evil empires, changing the hatred within us, moving the world slowly, forcefully, bending us towards love and truth. On this day of great gladness, empower us to be your ambassadors, proclaiming the good news. Good news in our kitchens and living rooms, good news in our offices and workshops, good news in the fields and the factories. Help us to be that good news, walking softly on this good earth, caring gently for all people, living hopefully into your kingdom. Today, we think of all of the woes who are grieving and for the sick and dying in our congregation. For the places in the world that are torn by war and bloodshed. In this world of broken hopes and dreams, we catch sight of your kingdom come. In the person of Jesus Christ, who lives and forever reigns. You, O oh God, and answered us. You have turned our weeping into song. Through the voices of women at the tomb, you have showed us your presence, and you have reminded us that even death cannot hold you from us. And so we pray today as your son has taught us singing, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
devoted disciples. It's no wonder that she stayed at the foot of the cross as Jesus died and watched as Joseph of Arimathea took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in a linen shroud, and placed it in a new tomb. It's no wonder that after the Sabbath, as soon as she could, she made her way back to the tomb at first light. We don't know if she was with Jesus just a few days before this, when Jesus stood in front of the temple in Jerusalem and said, if you destroy this temple, I will rebuild it in three days. People who heard him thought he was crazy. It took 46 years to build this temple. You can't rebuild it in three days. They didn't know that Jesus was talking about his body, his death. They didn't know that he was headed to the cross, to crucifixion. But we do. And it makes sense because you can't confront corrupt systems of injustice like the Roman Empire and not pay for it. Jesus was going to die and not just any death, but a horrific death by execution, by crucifixion, a tool of Caesar's state-sponsored terrorism meant to provoke fear and to keep citizens in line. The Roman cross was the symbol for everything unjust in the world, violence, oppression, hate, murder, genocide. If you're visiting with us today, let me catch you up just a little bit. Our theme for Lent this year was learning to lament. The dictionary defines lament as a passionate expression of sorrow, grief, or mourning. In scripture, lament is found in Psalms, in the book of Lamentations, and in Job. It is a prayer practice used in worship in the Old Testament for holding the brokenness of God, the brokenness of the world before God. It is expressing sorrow, pain, mourning, grief before God. On Good Friday, when Jesus was crucified, he quoted a psalm of lament on the cross. Psalm 22. On the cross, Jesus cried out in lament, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? While I don't understand how all of this works within Trinitarian theology, Jesus' words make it clear that he felt alone on the cross abandoned by his father, and he lamented. He cried out in anguish. When Jesus, the Son of God, lamented, every prayer of human lament that has ever been prayed was taken up into the divine life in a new and unprecedented way. On the cross, Christ brought lament into the reality of God. The God who hears our laments, our every cry of pain and suffering, prayed a lament, a prayer of pain and suffering. I can tell you that if it were not for the cross, I don't think I could trust in God. Because in a world of real and deep pain, I don't think I could trust in a God who is immune to pain. 
But through the incarnation and the cross, God laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood and tears and death. The God who hears our lament lamented. Yet, as David Kelsey writes, a drowning world doesn't need God to jump in and drown. No, it needs a rope and a life raft. Mary Magdalene, who had been healed by Jesus, has witnessed this divine life extinguished on a cross. She is without a doubt overcome with despair. No wonder Mary is standing outside the tomb weeping. Finally, Mary gathers herself and steps inside that cold chamber. The sun is rising now, casting long shadows across the garden. As she enters the tomb, seems lit. Two men in bright white, dressed in long robes, one at the foot and other at the head where Jesus' body had been laid, ask her, why are you crying? She sobs out her story again. They have taken away my Lord. I don't know where they have put him. She dissolves into tears. She is lamenting, grieving the death of her healer, her friend. When Mary looks up, the men are gone. She turns. There the sun, shining through the doorway, silhouettes him. Yet another man, the gardener, she supposes, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She begins her sad tale for the third time of grave robbers who have desecrated the tomb and taken the teacher, the healer, who restored her to wholeness. If you have taken him, she pleads, tell me where he is. I will retrieve his body. Mary, he says. The voice is so familiar in sudden recognition. She looks up, Rabbi, and she falls at his feet rejoicing. It is the Lord. It's Jesus. He is not dead. He is risen. He is alive. The very same Jesus. He cries out in lament on the cross, provides the answer to humanity's lament. Because Jesus resurrected reveals a God who can be the greatest sufferer and yet still God. He is a rope and a life raft. Jesus took on the Roman cross, the symbol for everything unjust in the world. Violence, oppression, hatred, and murder. God descended into the greatest hell that humans have to offer. God suffered and died. But thanks be to God, the tomb is empty. Christ is alive. He is risen, which means God is able, more than able, to help, to deliver, to redeem, to save. He is a rope and a life raft. As Rebecca Ann Elklin writes, God is revealed in both cross and resurrection. The cry from the cross and the hope of the resurrection shape each other. Lament may be a Good Friday prayer, but it makes no sense without Easter. Without Easter, lament is only despair. In the cross and the resurrection, in lament and vindication, God is both with us and for us. So Jesus invites us, invites you to trust in him and in the power of the resurrection, in this life and in the life to come. Because I believe that in this life, there is a mysterious presence, the presence of the suffering God that meets each of us in our lowest moment. It embraces us, hears our lament, and will not let us go. The presence is an assurance that we are living in a world that is in the midst of rescue. And every good thing in this world, every cooing baby, 
every fair and honest act, every kind word, every generous heart, every laugh, every passionate embrace, every hint of hope and beauty is a sign that Christ is alive and that victory and restoration will someday fully come. The world will be made whole. It is not yet complete, but Christ risen means rescue is underway. So Jesus invites us to trust in the power of the resurrection. In this life and in the one to come. Almost every year, my good friend from seminary texts me Easter morning, usually early. Three little words, he is risen. And I text her back, he is risen indeed. Years ago, this same friend who texts me on Easter morning lost her sister to suicide. She writes, 10 years ago today, my sister took her life. We spent three long, hard days keeping vigil over her hospital bed, trying to bring her and her body back to life. But finally, her body said, no, I meant it. Let me go. She writes, there are many ways to talk about this, to understand this, to live with this, but one thing is for sure. There's no one like her, her vitality and creativity, her faith and commitment, her thoughtfulness and loyalty, her sense of humor are deeply missed by all she allowed to truly know her and love her. My friend writes, every year since she died, the Easter journey for me has been about her. I picture her raised with Christ, healed and whole. Christ's resurrection means death is not the last word. Lament is not the last word. Sorrow is not the last word. Pain is not the last word. Violence is not the last word. Hate is not the last word. No, all of this, like rags, is left behind in the tomb. And from that tomb, Christ arises alive. He is risen. Alleluia. Let's stand and sing together of the risen Christ.
Will you take your bulletin and join me in the responsive observance of Holy Communion? We gather at the table of the risen Jesus, a place fashioned and furnished by love and rich with its promises. So come, whether you have seen and believed or are dubious and doubting, whether you confess confidently or with a fragile, fearful heart. Come and share these gifts of grace, encounter Christ, and be healed by love and transformed by life. Before the bright dawn in the garden, before the cold silence of the tomb, before the black horror of the cross, before the bitter struggle of another garden. Jesus, eating a final supper with his friends, blessed and broke bread and poured out a cup of wine. So we too, recalling that moment and honoring that life, take and break this bread and pour out the cup as a confirmation and sign that we are part of its ongoing story. And remembering with wonder and joy, we join our voices with that of creation and with all those who bear witness across the world and throughout the ages to the transforming power of God's love and life. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. You will receive the elements at your seat. We invite you just to hold them and we will take them all together when everyone has been served. Here at First Baptist, we celebrate open communion, which means all who call on the name of Christ are invited to take part in communion with us.
So we eat together, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Blood of Christ, the cup of grace. For these gifts, God, we give you thanks.
thank you, choir, for sending us out with such beautiful music. And also thank you, we want to say thank you to Brenda Rice, uh, one of our administrative assistants, who has this beautiful artistic gift to put together this liturgical art. And some church members from the worship team helped her as well. So thank you to everyone who helped put the liturgical art together. As you're on your way out today, uh, there is some snacks and food out there for you to um, eat here, or I think they've even boxed some up for you to take home. So if you need muffins to go, they're out in the hallway there. And just a few other announcements for you before you go. Since we have been learning to lament and talking about lament and grief and mourning the entire Lenten season, we decided that it was time to celebrate Holy Laughter Sunday next Sunday and to bring back that practice. We've done this a couple of times in the past, but it's an opportunity to continue celebrating and giving thanks for the resurrection of Jesus and our own smaller resurrection. So prepare yourself next Sunday. You are invited to bring good, clean jokes that you can tell in church. You're invited to wear crazy colors and crazy socks, you know, funny hats, all that kind of stuff. So come next Sunday ready to have a little fun to celebrate. And also, uh, For Columbia is coming up. It's our annual opportunity to serve in missions projects across the city. There are projects for people of all ages and abilities, including projects for families with children. You can sign up even today out in the hallway. There's a bulletin board that lists those projects. And go by, check it out, and sign up to serve on um, April the... 28th, so coming up. And finally, if you are a parent, we have a seminar coming up next weekend that you will not want to miss with licensed clinical social worker and ordained minister, Reverend Leanne Gardner. She's returning to First Baptist via Skype. She was with us a couple of years ago talking about safe sexual awareness and family empowerment, training parents how to talk to your kids about sexuality and faith and all of those things. And she will be back with us next Saturday night in a seminar called Talking to Your Kids About Sexual Harassment and Assault. Kind of as a response to the Me Too movement that's been going on in the last year, we decided that we want to partner with parents to raise healthy kids emotionally, spiritually, all the way around. So we invite parents to sign up for that seminar this week. It is next Saturday night. So will you stand for the benediction and join me? It is responsive. Good to have you all with us today. Go into the world trusting in the resurrection. The stone has been rolled away. The tomb is empty. Jesus is our living companion on the journey. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Amen. Amen.